Hello, Leela, and thank you for joining me on this webinar. Well, hello, Sam, and thank you for asking me. This is exciting. I like this topic. Yes, it's a very, very important topic, and you are an extremely experienced adjudicator or judge, I'm not sure what you call it, of the festivals. So, because we have a Stedford here which have adjudicators, you have festivals with ha which have judges or adjudicators, yeah. or what would you call? We what? call them either, yes, they can be called either. Okay, so it's your job to judge performances, and it's also your job as a teacher to be preparing these performances, mm -hmm. so you have a lot to tell us. Uh, so I'm going to give you carte blanche and you can just, you can just start. You know, I think I have come to a list that works pretty well with my students in preparing them for any kind of festival, competition, whatever. And that came from seeing students play for me when I was adjudicating. And I noticed that they weren't it was almost like a deer in the headlights like okay what am i doing here nobody told me about this and like what's this in front of me and i i felt bad for them because i thought you know what this is not fair to them they maybe have pre prepared a piece but they may not know what it's like to play for other people in a strange room on a very foreign piano so i think the tips that I can offer you today would be things that I have taken from my experience and what I've seen in students when I do judge them or evaluate them and then how I help my own students prepare for that arena. <laughs> that sounds excellent. So I believe you have a list of 10. <clears throat> I do. Okay, well, I'll start with what I do when students are getting ready to play. First of all, I have a, a living room with a wonderful piano named Bella, and it's a fabulous grand piano, and I'm spoiled by it, and my students are as well. They can't wait to go upstairs and play on Bella, but they do not play on Bella until their pieces are performance ready, meaning they've got it memorized, all that kind of stuff. And then we go upstairs and we practice the five P's of performing. And so those are posture, prepare, perform, polite, and pride. So the very first thing is their posture. So I want them to take the time to adjust their bench. I think a lot of, a lot of kids will just sit down like, okay, this is the way it is. And yeah. I want them to say, this is your time. Take your time. No one is rushing you. Get that bench where it needs to be. And then the other thing is to look for the pedal how many times I haven't seen kids play and they didn't look for the pedal and they grab that middle one and then it sounds weird the rest of the time and they're shooken up by their entire performance because the pedal was not correct. They didn't have their foot on the correct pedal. So I make a big deal about looking with their eyes for the pedal, like, you know, reach around with your head and look for it. Uh, the next thing is then prepare. So put their hands in the place on the piano. That's another thing that, I, you know, it's a new piano. Okay, wait, I oh, Wait, I always knew where my hands go and now suddenly I don't remember. And a lot of it has to do with those little letters uh, in the middle of the piano. If they're not the same as the piano that they practice on at home, it may just throw them. So I really have them practice. Get your hands up on the keys. And then once they're prepared and have their hands there, I want them to think about the sound and the tempo of their piece before they begin. So they actually hear it in their heads. So they know the tempo that they're gonna take before they begin. And then they perform. And then I, I basically say get in the zone and perform with confidence. And that zone is so hard to come by, I, you know, because those little demons come in and they start talking with you. So I don't say a lot about that. I don't like to use the word nervous with students because then that plants the seed. Oh, I'm supposed to be nervous about this. But I do want to give them a mindset of, okay, I'm performing. And I think one of the best ways to prepare them is to record them. You know, now we all have our smartphones. You know, that camera is the best feedback. It's, it's the closest thing that we can get to simulating an actual performance. So I do a lot of video recording so that they can practice with their game on type mindset. And then after they perform, then there's two important things that I want them to do. I want to them to acknowledge the audience's applause with a bow. So we learn how to bow. And uh, I, I basically say cut yourself in half and then they dip down, of course, and then say hippopotamus. And then they come back up. So about that long or are my shoes tied? 
yes, my shoes are tied, something like that. But just, it, it can't be too fast. And then you can't bow with your head up in the air because then you're gonna look like a turtle. So we do a lot of weird bowing type stuff. So we just get over, you know, what that, what is that gonna look like? And what is the best bow? Yeah. It Wait, can't can be I, too fast. Can I ask yes, because yes. Because I have a uh -huh. burning question about that. Okay. <laughs> yes, all of the things, you know, bend over, I say to them, you know, oh, count your shoes. Oh, one shoe, two shoes. Okay, so that's, that's about enough. And I also tell them they can't do a wiggles bow. This is a this is a wiggles bow. This is a Shakespearean bow. It's not one hand on your tongue, <laughs> one hand behind your back. They all go yeah. do that. I'm not sure why. But I would like to ask you, what do you tell them to do with their hands when they bow? Well, I say, I, I'll, I'll say cut yourself in half, you know, just to help them feel where they should bow, because some of them don't know where to bow, you know, that, that body awareness might not be there. So I'll say that or keep your hands by your side. Most of them keep their hands by their side. Some of them curtsy. I mean, I have some people that, you know, I don't know, they're gymnasts. And so they're like, ah! you know, <laughs> all kind of stuff. So I'm to <laughs> calm them down a little bit. But yes, basically, I think the key is not to make the bow too fast. It has to be slow and then you come back up. That's right. It's got to be gracious. It's a way of saying it, Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Um, gracious. Okay. Yes. So is it hands, do they just dangle in the air forwards when they're bowing forwards or do they their hands slide down their legs? Or uh, I would say they usually slide down their legs. I mean, you've seen both. You see people do both. Uh, they, they do all kinds of things. Like some of the girls like to curtsy. I don't, I haven't run into that lately. But there's there's going to be a variety of but I think the most important thing is to not make it too fast. The other thing is if they're playing with a duet partner, I make a big deal about, OK, so who's ever on the end, you stand aside, make a hallway for the other person and then you bow together and I make a big deal about that. And a lot of times in recitals that won't happen. So then I'll, I'll describe, OK, now we're going to do it again and then we'll bow correctly. So I don't think there's anything wrong with just practicing that etiquette, because that's the other thing. The last P is pride, and I want them to show their pride by smiling, which is not an easy thing to do because they may not be happy with their performance or they may be just scared and they're fearful. And like, you got to smile. You got to you got to acknowledge that, yes, I did this and be proud of it. That is absolutely 100% true. And, and that's one, I think it's one of my seven deadly performance sins is that you, you have to have a poker face. You have to smile, even if you thought it was the worst performance of your life, but you have to be very gracious because um, the audience will be clapping for you and you have to be gracious after the performance as well. So if an audience member comes up to you and says, oh, wow, that was so great. Thank you. You must just say, Oh, thank you. Even if you weren't happy, you no. have to smile and accept their compliment and not say, oh, no, it's the most awful playing, because that is like slapping it back in their face. You, you, you have to have pride, no matter what, how you played. Being Correct. The key. That's that's really tricky. Well, I love all those P words. Yeah, I, I think I those came to me, I don't know, kind of really quickly, but I've used these now for years and years and years. And that really does equip students. And I'll use these in group lessons where, you know, they're just playing for each other, but then I'll say, okay, what does that person have to do now? Oh, check their posture, you know? And so just have fun with it so that they remember it. It just becomes a habit. Uh, I was going to say too, when acknowledging someone's compliments, you know, I play at church on Sunday. So a lot of times people will say, oh, that was so beautiful. And I'll say thank you. And then immediately like, I'll say, you know, I love that composer. I, isn't that just a great piece? And I think that's a nice way to, you know, like take the take the attention off myself, even be, because it's usually like so I'm, I'm thinking in my head, oh my gosh, but if they only know how the B section should have <laughs> sounded, but it's more of just, you know, just deflecting it away from me and, and back to them into a conversation about the music itself. And I, that has helped me a lot, knowing what to say to people. Yes, that's marvelous. I really like that. If so, even if you if you're feeling nervous, if you don't know what to say, um, and if you, especially if you're unhappy with your performance, and even if mm -hmm. you are happy because you don't want to say, if someone says, "Oh, that was really great," you don't want to say, "I know, right?" I right. Never, I know. <laughs> you do want yeah. some sense of humility. So to be able to say, "Oh, thank you. I just love that piece so much." Mm -hmm. It. Mm -hmm it's very it's lovely and self-deprecating and puts the focus on the music as it should That's mm -hmm. the point. yeah 
Yeah. So it. that that has worked for me for years and years. It helped me feel comfortable with compliments in general because you know whenever you play you're going to get them because most people can't do what we are doing right now. And that's the other thing I tell my students like listen regardless of how you did no one else in the room knows that piece like you do. You know, and um, that that's not the case in in an adjudicator <laughs> type situation. But in general, when when you perform, you know, even the adjudicator, if it's a tough piece, they may not know all the ins and outs. They're sitting there writing things. They're they're not going to pay attention to everything. They're looking for the whole big picture. So, the more we can train our students to think that way, the better. That is fantastic. And so, when you are getting your students, you're in a group situation. You're going through these five P's you're also thinking of what you saw as an adjudicator and you mm -hmm. said you were inspired by being an adjudicator so um like obviously you, you've seen some examples where these things have not happened and would you say that um the actual playing is affected um and i mean the overall impression is is affected but would you say the actual playing is affected badly when you see that these things are not done I think so. And I think it has everything to do with confidence. You know, even if a student isn't, doesn't play perfectly or, you know, just didn't have the piece where it should have been, if they're confident in how to perform, I think that's half the battle right there. That will sell me, you know, even if their performance isn't stellar, but can they come in and know what they're doing and find their way, get their, you know, get the bench the way they want. I think that is going to boost their overall performance because they've been informed. I was, uh, we had a festival over the weekend. And so one of my students played and they play within a small group and it was a really small group. It was just three different people, but two of them, um, they asked who wanted to go first and two of them like, oh no, I don't want to go first. And so my student Caitlin jumped in and went first. And then I asked her that, you know, when you listen to them, how did they sound? Did they sound confident? And and she's she's very intuitive, but she did say, yes, that, you know, they did well, but you could tell that they lacked a little bit of confidence. So it's too bad because I'm not adjudicating right now. You know, if I was in the, the heat of it right now, I'm going to uh, do more in April, then I could give you some specifics. But it's overall, you know, how they approach the piano. And uh, one of the things that I notice is when um, I adjudicate certain festivals, then we allow them to warm up on the piano. And I don't really get that term <laughs> because we are all, by the time you get there, man, you gotta be ready to play, right? It's not like you're warming up your fingers for the first time in the day. Uh, so- the opposite, often your fingers feel cold because all your adrenaline is, is all the blood is pumping to your, your vital organs. <laughs> Uh, I right. used to suffer terribly with the the uh, perception of cold fingers that I couldn't move, and and I would get so frustrated because as soon as I finished performing, suddenly my hands would be lovely and warm, and it's because the adrenaline stops and my blood flowed out to my extremities. So um, yeah, warming. Here's one tip. I do this a lot. Have you done that before? Okay. That gets blood to your fingertips. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I'll okay. do that. Um, so what I what I did because of that, because I would say, would you like to warm up? And then they'd look at me like, no. And like, okay. And I feel like that is a gift if you can warm up on a piano that you've never played before. So I made a big deal about that with my students as well. And uh, so I call it making friends or shaking hands with a foreign piano. And so we design, we craft a warm up for them to explore the piano. It is not about how fast they can play a scale. They are not showing off how they can play a scale. They are investigating, exploring this piano. What does it take to make a loud sound? What does it take to make a soft sound? How are the keys weighted? Are they heavy? Are they light? All that kind of stuff. So I really now gear students up for that warm up time if they're allowed it, just so that they can make friends with it. And so they also play a cadence and test out the pedal with that as well. Um, but I think that has really helped them get to know the piano and just being sensitive to the fact that pianos are not all the same. You know, I, that's an education in itself. And if your students aren't aware of that and they sit down on a piano they've never played, and like, why is this it's not playing? You know, it's probably they're using their fingers and not their arm weight, those kind of things. So I th that's one of the signs of mm, probably an insecure performer that when when they don't know what to do, when I ask them if they'd like to warm up, then 
I, I don't think they've been fully prepared to perform. That is so interesting because um, I think certainly in the examination system in Australia, uh, it's it's I my, I've never had a student who's been given the opportunity to warm up. They have to go <laughs> and start playing cold. In an Estedford situation, you go on stage, you just have to start playing your piece. Right. But in a festival situation, you're saying even though it is judged, it is a it is a competition. Students are given the opportunity to warm up mm -hmm. and. Um, therefore, and you equip them with exactly what they should do to familiarize themselves with the piano. And mm -hmm. yeah, that does, that does sound like a gift that that is a gift. It is. I know. So take advantage of it if it's given to you. And if not, Sam, I think that's a whole nother thing is how do you deal with this piano that's not responding the way your piano did at home? And that can be so jarring to nerves right there. So I think preparing our students for that as well and probably just playing on a number of different pianos. That's why we don't go up on Bella right away. You know, we play on different pianos and just get used to how different pianos feel and sound. Yes, wonderful, wonderful advice. Okay, so we've had your five Ps of, of mm -hmm. uh, what do you call them? The five Ps of? Five Ps of performing. Five Ps of performing. And yes. then what, what was your next list? Uh, well, okay, so first of all, I have, you know, how to make friends with a piano. And so I talked about that, but basically it is, um, you know, having some kind of scale to use uh, to play within the key of your first piece, and then also a cadence that uses the pedal, something that gives them the opportunity to use the pedal. So that's that list. And then I have tips for a top performance, 10 tips for a, pop, a top performance. I can't say that very fast. Don't say it five times in a row. So would you like me to go through those? Yes, please. Okay, so first of all, favor the left hand. Uh, overall, I've learned through <clears throat> some really rough spots myself in recitals that our, my ear tends to hear the right hand, I pay attention to the right hand. So all of my students memorize their left hand alone. I just think that is so important. And they know the chords, where are you going next? Where, what chord is this? Why is this chord so important? So favor the left hand in memorizing. And then the second one is avoid the automatic pilot button. And so what that means is, you know, like once they get to know a piece, they just play it over and over and over and over because they like it, but they're not bringing their brain into their practice. And then what happens is they sit down to perform and then all of a sudden the brain goes on fire. Like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Whoa, I, well, are you sure you know that? And then that's when all that self-talk and self-doubt comes in. So uh, to avoid that automatic pilot, I like students to divide up a piece into six parts and then they roll a dice and then uh, wherever they land or where what the dice says, they start at what section two, play all the way to the end, start at the beginning and then end at section two. So they're always starting in different places just to kind of mess with their brain just a little bit and build that retrieval system. Um, and then schedule mock performances. So have a parent sit there, have, you know, just a warm human being sitting in the same room is going to change that level of angst just a little, I don't like to call it angst, but it does, you know, it puts you on a new level of awareness because someone's listening to you. And like, I even think stuffed animals work. <laughs> so, you know, if, if not, nothing else, bring out a stuffed animal, uh, map out the peaks and valleys. Uh, this has been a fun thing to do, especially with, you know, each phrase has a beginning, a middle and the end. And usually there's a middle section that, you know, the, the part that you're going to crescendo to, and then um, they'll diminuendo afterwards. But I also like to add a Pikes Peak. Now, Pikes Peak is the tallest mountain in Colorado. And so every piece has a Pikes Peak. It has that climactic point. And I feel like if students know where that is, that also gives them that focus. Oh, here we go. This is my big moment, you know, where we're bringing things in and it, it helps them tell the story of the piece, gives them focus. Uh, number five is add chord symbols. So I kind of talked about that already by favoring the left hand and knowing the chords, the chord progression. Where's that five chord? Why is that five chord so important? And when do you finally get to land on the one? Um, so smile for the camera. So take videos of yourself. I'll have students, you know, just do that at home. Just take a video and then listen to it. What do you think? How did it sound? The camera, you know, is unforgiving. It tells all very, very, very accurately. Really <laughs> Unfortunately, does. yeah, it does. And when uh, you back, sorry, if I can just jump in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Back to yourself suddenly, 
you think, oh my gosh, did I really, did I really play like that? Did I really play that fast? Did I really not do any dynamics? And it is an absolute education. So not just to put yourself in that simulated pressure situation by recording yourself, but to actually listen back uh, evaluatively is, is so, so, so important. And you just don't realize how your own playing is coming across sometimes. I know. Well, and I'll be surprised that kids will be like, yeah, that was good. Like, oh, okay. You know, so then that hel helps me realize like, oh, okay, I got to train their ears a little bit more. Like, is really, is that the, is that your quietest piano that you can create right there? Because I'm not hearing that big a difference, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, okay, so seven is train for a marathon. So you only get one chance to play through a piece, but if you can play it through two, maybe even three times right in a row, you know, like that's going to help you just get to that one the way you want to. Uh, and then narrow your focus. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Like just pick one thing. Like, okay, how crisp are my staccatos? You know, go through the whole piece and really listen for your staccatos. Or, wow, I, you know, I'm going to really listen for all those piano sections. How quietly can I make them? Um, or really focus on your tempo. Um, I really, what's interesting, Sam, is I'm really using the metronome more and more and more myself in my own practice. And my, I'm using it with my students all the time. And I find it comforting. It's a really weird thing. But once you know a piece, you don't want to rush using the metronome. But once they're ready, it it shows me where I'm rushing. That's right. Just That's take right. your time. Take yeah. your time. And it helps me relax more than anything else. It's a weird thing. Yes. Um was it you who referred to the metronome as an instrument of torture? Oh, yes, yes, that is, yes. That is how I view it if you, when you're trying to practice with it. It's, it's just horrible. But what it does do is, is exactly what you said. It gives you information. It tells mm -hmm. you if you're, if you're not comfortably playing along with the metronome, that is, that is information, that you are rushing your, or you are lagging. And in some cases, that, that is appropriate. But in, in many, it might be a shock. So... Um, yeah, I think that's, that is, that is great. That the trick is fun. not to introduce it early, you know, and I think that's the problem. That's why it can be a tool of torture because they're just not ready. They're, they're not ready to align themselves with an outside beat when they can't even keep an inside beat. Yes. You know, yes. it's, it's a whole skill, but um, yes. I call it proficient, but it's, it's a new level of practice. Okay, get this piece at proficient level. And that means entire piece at one tempo, zero errors, or, you know, close to zero errors. Yes. Yes. It's hard because playing with a metronome involves, it's, it's a huge listening skill. You're mm -hmm. aligning your playing with something else and you're listening mm -hmm. and playing. It's very tricky. It is. It is. Uh, but when students can do that, then you it's it's awareness. I think that was the one point I wanted to bring about, too, is that um, being aware of your environment and yourself and how you're feeling is important as a performer, you know, and if you're not aware of, you know, how you're sitting or whatever and how how you're approaching the bench and how you're going to start the piece, you know, how do you want that first note to sound? that the level of awareness I can see in, in players, you know, those who have been trained to think about how, what they're going to play before they play it. Um, and then the other one, oh, test the fashion runway. <clears throat> I, I really want, if they're going to wear any sh kind of fancy shoes or whatever, they have to test it with the pedal, you know, because I don't know, have you had it where your foot slid off the pedal or? Oh, worse. Like that, yeah. This is another thing I talk about in my seven deadly performance scenes yeah. that, um, yes, you, you well, athletes have a saying, nothing new on race day. And so oh, you're not okay. allowed to wear, uh, you know, new, new trainers or a different top or have a different uh, breakfast from what you would normally have nothing new on race day mm -hmm. everything has to be rehearsed to to run your best race so that's the same for for performance you literally need dress rehearsals so mm -hmm. i definitely fell victim to the shoe thing and the pedaling thing um i selected a lovely pair of heels for my recital they had not practiced in them and then on the day they, there were floorboards. It was slightly slippery. I had to work so hard to hold my foot in place that I got a cramp in my calf mm -hmm. while I was performing, which was mm -hmm. incredibly distracting. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
from there I realized, aha, you have to practice in the shoes that you're going to perform in. Yes. Oh, I've been there before those cramps. Well, and you know, I'll get it. Yeah. From the pedal, but also from my Bluetooth page turner, because your, your foot is always kind of up, you know, and if I'm, if I'm, which I can be, I can be tense and I can be, you know, nervous or whatever. And then, yeah, I'll just tense up. So uh, yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> it keeps us humble. That's, that's for sure. Uh, and then the rest, the last one is rehearse the five P's of performing. So those are my 10 tips for a top performance. That is fantastic. I just have one final question for you. When can you tell the difference between a performer who is just is very well prepared, but is being slightly debilitated by nerves on the day? Um, and uh, um, and do you give do you give credit for that? Do you do you sort of um, assign value to the fact that you you can really see that it's nerves that are getting them as opposed to unpreparedness? I definitely can. And I just feel for them. I, I, you know, that's just not how you want to show up. And especially if you've prepared for a piece. So yes, I have extended grace before. To, I'll say, would you like to start over? I think starting over though, it was not always the best thing because they're going to get caught in that sand trap again. I like to call it that, but you know, can they move on? And you know, if they can move forward and start in a new place and regroup, recover and, and then I'm all I'm all for them. I think that is the key. If they cannot recover, then they they really were not prepared. And that's why they're nervous. You know, maybe there's there's different reasons for people to be nervous. One of them could be that they were were not prepared. And so, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Some may be fully prepared, but the nerves just kick in and they can't control it. I think there is a difference. And, um, you know, I I would hope that they could pre that they could move on and finish. Um, but usually the people that can't finish were not prepared and were nervous about it. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. And I use your quote all the time hmm. for my students, which is that performing is not about perfection. It is about recovering from mm -hmm. imperfection. And mm -hmm. it's so comforting to hear that you as a judge, as an adjudicator, will really give a lot of grace for that if you if they if they can come back it doesn't matter how bad the fall was if they can come back then that's worth a lot it, it's it's very valuable it's, and it's a life lesson you know we are all going to fail uh at some point you know the hurdler is going to knock down a hurdle and you know it, things happen and uh getting back up dusting yourself and getting back up it was interesting i had a student who uh didn't he was very prepared and I think maybe over prepared, but he was prepared and it didn't go the way he wanted to. And he he was upset about it. He was. And so I finally said, you know what? I think what you need to do is be able to forgive yourself because self-compassion goes a long way. And um, I know I have to do that myself. But then I talked to him today at his lesson. I said, well, how are you feeling? He said, well, I felt a lot better because we went and had a donut. So yeah. <laughs> if all else fails, just grab a donut. <laughs> Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Beautiful. So, Leela, do you have any final pearls of wisdom for us? Well, I came up with one last week, and that one is perfection is a worthy goal, but imperfection is reality. And then a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a blog and I titled it Genuine Over Perfect. And that's been my mantra. And that's helped me get through a few rough times, that's for sure. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So imperfection is reality and genuine over perfect. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thanks, mm -hmm. Leela. Thank you, Sam. All the best to you. Thanks. Bye.